Hello, good morning everyone and thank you for attending this event. We're very grateful that you were able to find times from your very busy schedules to attend this workshop. Um, it's a life-saving workshop and it's a workshop that's going to make a huge difference, not just to yourselves or your students, but the generality of Anambra, the Anambra and Nigerians. Um, we're looking at the rational and background uh, that's the justifications for the anti cervical and anti-breast cancer teachings in secondary schools in Anambra State. I'm Associate Professor Chris Ifedior of the Griffith University School of Medicine in Australia. I'm also the president of the OCA Foundation, who are the sponsors of this event. Thank you very much for attending, and hopefully we'll uh, gain the best of the lessons from this uh, workshop. So please pay detailed attention. There'll be time for questions at the end of it all. Um, let's look at the introduction, a bit of a general introduction regarding what we are doing and why we find it necessary to do this. Um, it's known, it's on records that over the next 20 years, the costs, global costs of death from non-communicable diseases might exceed 30 trillion United States dollars. That's 30 trillion, not million, not billion, but trillion dollars. Now, the non-communicable diseases are things like breast and cervical cancers, basically illnesses, diseases, that we get, not by passing it on from other people, all right? Infectious, non-infectious diseases, basically. Now, about 40 million deaths every year are attributable to non-communicable diseases, like high blood pressures, like cancers, like heart attacks, like strokes, uh, like road accidents, all right? So that's a huge number, 40 million deaths a year. Now, 78% of these deaths, that's 31 million deaths, are from low and low middle income countries like Nigeria, like most African countries. So this is these are huge numbers. So we have a disproportionate burden of this of these illnesses. Unfortunately, only one percent of universal health funding is marked out to prevent these non-communicable diseases. So we have huge numbers, but then those that finance healthcare, which unfortunately are not African countries, these are Western world countries in the Western world. Only 1% of the money earmarked go to prevent these diseases. But we see that 40 million of these deaths happen every year and 31 million of these deaths um, happen in developing countries. We only have 1%. For every 100 million, we only have 1 million to, to fight these illnesses with. And this is only because current attention is on communicable non-cancer infectious diseases like HIV, like malaria, like tuberculosis. And this includes childhood immunizations. We cannot relate to this, I'm sure. Um, when you listen to the news, you'll hear it talks about HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, immunizations. But hardly ever do you hear about breast and cervical cancers and strokes and all that, even though they're the bigger killers. So we have to do something about it. Well, even more worrying is that cancers like breast and cervical cancers account for nine of the 40 million deaths associated with non communicable diseases. All right, hope this fact sinks in. And this number is second only to cardiovascular diseases in the burden of non-communicable diseases in developing countries. So huge issues with cancer, but yet very little is being done about it. A bit more on breast cancer, just more facts. It's the commonest malignancy in the world. It is apart from lung and some skin cancers. Lung cancer, skin cancer are very common, but breast cancer comes next after them. It constitutes about 11.9% of all cancers as the fifth commonest cause of death from cancers globally. In 2015, it accounted for 571,000 deaths across the world. That's over half a million. These are huge numbers. Uh, I'm sure numbers from 2018 and 2017 will be more than this. Unfortunately for us, all the incidence is gradually increasing among women. So put it in context, in 1960, out of every 20 women, one will get breast cancer. Currently, as of 2017, out of every eight women, one will get breast cancer. Now, these numbers are from developed countries. We don't have the statistics from our own world, from our own developing countries. However, we know that the numbers from our countries are gradually matching these levels in the Caucasian world. It's been put down to lifestyle changes. And I'm sure we can all relate to this. More women don't have children till they're in their 30s. And even when they do, they only have one or two. And most times, some of them don't breastfeed. So these are factors that increase cancer risks. Most of them also smoke and drink. All these lifestyle changes increase our risk of breast cancers. 
One other thing to note is that breast cancers also happen in males, so it's not just females. We males do have breasts, even though they are small, and one percent of all breast cancers, actually less than that, happen in males. So it's something to keep in mind. Breast cancer reduces life expectancy in any population where it's affected. Women die early from it. An age of mean presentation in Nigeria is among women in their early 40s, precisely between 42 and 44 years. So if it's people this old, why then do we bother with teenagers in high schools, in senior secondary schools? Why do we bother with young women in their early 20s? Well, the facts will tell us this. One of them is because when women get it at age under the four, under 40, the prognosis, the outcome is poor. So they die more and they survive less. In Nigeria, cases have been reported in someone as low as 14 years. All cases have been reported in those between 14 and 96 years of age. And as we can see, teenagers are not spared. About 12% of all breast cancers in Nigeria are among women under the age of 30 years. This is huge. So 12% of all breast cancer in Nigeria happen in women under the age of 30 years. It even gets more interesting from here because about 3%, that's 3 out of every 100, will happen in a woman under the age of 25 years. And nearly 1% will happen in a woman under the age of 20. So about 1 out of every case, or just under that, will happen in a woman under the age of 20 years for every 100 cancers we have. Now, 1% is small, isn't it? I know, in every hundred. But when you have a population in Nigeria with over 50 million women, so you're looking at out of the hundred, we have one. Out of 1,000, we have 10. Out of 100,000, we're looking at 100 women. Now, out of every million, we're looking at a 1,000. And it goes on and on and on. So we have thousands of young women that are at risk of this cancer. And the roots are in early ages. And as we can know, we die. Well, women die from this. And that's because of knowledge. If we can get this right and arm them early on in their lives, we're going to save lives. And keeping in mind that it's not just them. They're going to teach their sisters, teach their moms, teach their friends, and teach their daughters when they do have children. So the effect is multiplicative. And that's why we are starting early. In a developing country like Nigeria, there's no functional preventive program in place. So in the Western world, like Australia, you know, a woman from 40 automatically begins to get screened. Even before that, any woman that picks up is, you know, the, the symptom really has free treatment. In Nigeria, it's not like that. If you cannot find, you cannot afford to get treatment or cure, you're not going to survive this. You're going to be a victim. But we all know that early screen and detection are vital to, so, so, to, to survival because they reduce associated morbidities and mortality, complications and deaths from it. So the whole idea of this is to encourage our women to screen early and to find ways of detecting the, uh, suspicious symptoms early. This is why we are here. And this is why we all hope to be mini champions after this workshop. Now, if you survive our facts, we need to note. If the cancer is detected while it's still confined to the breast, survival rates can be high. Up to 90% of women will survive. That's between 85 and 95%. So if we find these cancers while it's still confined to the breast tissues, many will survive. Unfortunately, you know, the cancer spreads. And most of the times our women come to the hospital when it's already late, when it's already gone to the skulls, to the brains. Uh, gone to the lungs, to the liver, and all that. So our whole essence of doing is to find a way to arm our women to pick these things up. So even when the government cannot give us free treatment, we have a good chance of surviving. Um, but in this in context, about 7% of Nigerian women present within one month of finding out suspicious lumps in their breasts. So a woman picks up a lump out of every 100 of women that do so, only about 7% see a doctor within one month. 70% or more delay for at least three months before seeking treatment. So even at three months, more than 70% will still not have seen a doctor. And remember, if we see a doctor earlier, about 90% will survive. Despite this small number, which is significant, we already talked about the 1% you know, that happens under the age of 20. Our women, our young women, have no idea that these things are there. You know, we did a study in 2017, the OCA Foundation, and we realized these facts. We realized there were poor levels of breast and cervical cancer, risk factor knowledge, and early symptom knowledge among this age group. But we all know that the risk starts with them, and we all know that catching them early will help. Even worse than that is about 6.1 percent of these young girls practice breast self-examination. So six percent. And even at that, only few do it well. Only few know the correct technique or the correct timing to do it. So it's basically useless to most of them. 
we can do something about it. And let's keep this in mind. About 56% will survive. Only 50% will survive if diagnosed late. And this is in the Western world. In Nigeria and other, number, other kind of countries like Nigeria, it doesn't happen. We're in trouble unless we do something. So let's come together and do this. And that's why we're investing in women like you to help us teach these youngsters and take this seriously. And let's look at cervical cancer, the other part of the equation. Now, although it's the fifth commonest cancer in the world, it's the second most common in developing countries like Nigeria. So all over the world, it's right, it ranks fourth, sorry, fourth as the cause, the common, as the cause of cancer in among women. But in Africa and Nigeria, it's ranked second. So it's quite common. It's particular among women aged between 40, 15 and 44 years. Now, a few numbers will help. In 2012, 444,000, that's nearly half a million or 84% of all cases reported worldwide were in developing countries. 84%, 84 out of every 100 women with cervical cancer in the world came from a country like Nigeria. And 270,000 deaths from this cancer were reported in 2012. Out of this, 85% were in developing countries. So 85 out of every 100 deaths from cervical cancer was from a woman in a country like Nigeria. Unfortunately, there's no government-funded preventive program. We understand there are plans to do this, but there's been a plan since I was in medical school, which was like 15 years ago. Um, so if we don't do something, nothing will happen. These facts, these uh, universal programs are not existing in developing countries, but they are quite available in women in high-income countries, in women in developed countries. So there's a need for us to find something that is effective, affordable, and sustainable as a way of reducing cervical cancer deaths. That's where we have the AMOIDS campaign. Um, the burden in Nigeria. So let's look at the facts from Nigeria. We have about 200 million people as of 2018. 54% of these are women. So you're looking at about over 100 million. And about 50.3 million of these women are more than 15 years and are at risk of cervical cancer. 50.3 million. It's probably higher than this when you look at the real facts. So these are the numbers that are exposed. So now in 2017 only, about 14,000 cases of cervical cancers were reported and over 8,000 of these women died in Nigeria. I'm sure someone here would know someone or know someone, someone or know somebody's family friend or someone who has had breast cancer or sorry, cervical cancer or died from it. It's real. The numbers get worse from here. By 2025, the International Agency for Research on Cancer has made a projection and that is that deaths from cervical cancer will rise by 63% among women under the age of 65 years. So the number of deaths will rise by 63% in women that are 65 years or less. For women above 65 years, the death toll will rise by at least 50%. This is the projection by 2025. So I'm sure you now see why we are spending energy and time and resources and money to do the AMOIDS campaign. And why, as champions of this program, you will also take it seriously with us. These are disturbing figures. These are huge burdens. And remember, if we don't do this, no one will do it for us. So please, let's come together. Let's take this seriously and get this fight to our youths. Now, more facts from the developing world. In 2018, the Global Cancer Incidence Mortality and Prevalence Data, it's called the Global Cancer Data, showed that the age standardized rates, it gave us the age standardized rates on incidence and mortality. And it's for every 100,000 women in a year. So let's look at the numbers. In North America, like the United States, about 6.4%, 6 6.5 6 of every 100,000 women would get it. But only 1.9%, only 1.9 out of this number would die. So 6.4% out of every 100,000 gets it, 1.9% dies. In Western Europe, like England, about 6.8% gets it, 2.1% dies. So similar to North America. Let's look at the number from West Africa. About 30 will get it and 23 will die. So while more of us get it, more of us die. But look at the other countries. Few get it, few die. But these countries also have in place ways to protect their people, but we don't. So the only thing we have is to arm our women, and particularly for cervical cancers. It's even much more effective to prevent this from younger ages than breast cancer. So if we don't do something, no one does it for us. 
These statistics highlight the grim realities faced by women in Nigeria. It provides urgent reasons for actions on cervical cancers, just like the Amal AIDS campaign. And it confirms that the existing policies are not working or maybe they're not being implemented. So let's look at a few things that will help us as to why we're intervening in high schools, in senior secondary schools. It's what we call the human papilloma virus. It's a virus similar to other viruses, but nearly all cases of cervical cancers are caused by this virus. Virtually all of them are caused by this virus. Now, this virus is extremely common and is sexually transmitted, just like HIV. But we all talk about HIV without talking about this. It's sexually transmitted. So if if you don't have sex, you're probably not going to get this virus, and that means you're not going to get cervical cancer. It's that simple. But even more worrying is that the earlier one gets exposed to sex, sexual activity, so the, in the teenage years, then the higher chance of you getting this virus. So if we can stop this from happening, then we have a good chance of protecting our children. Another important fact is that HPV, the human papilloma virus, it takes when a woman gets the virus, it takes about 10 to 20 years to develop into a cancer. So this gives us an important window of opportunity to prevent these cancers. So if a woman gets it at the age of 20, takes about 30, to, it takes, by the time she gets to 30 or 40, that's when she gets this cancer. So keeping this in mind, there are three known ways to prevent or three known strategies for preventing this cancer. One of them is vaccinations. It's available in developed countries and even in Nigeria from the age of nine to 13 for those in senior secondary schools. But while it's free and available to everyone in developed countries, it's not free and it's not available to everyone in Nigeria and other developing countries. So you have to buy it and most of us don't spend money on our health. The other way to prevent it is to screen. So remember, it takes 10 to 20 years, but if you screen within that time through pap smells like a cytology, there's a chance you can pick up the cancer, the virus before it even becomes cancer and you can get it treated. And the last way to prevent it is to create awareness regarding this. Now, the first two, the vaccinations and screenings cost money and many of us cannot afford it. But creation of awareness is free. And that's why we are doing the Arm Our Youth campaign. And that's why we're doing this. Now, these vaccines I explained exist, available for girls in nine to 13 years, but not free for everyone. Now, the difficulties in fighting this cancer in Nigeria is what we've already mentioned. The vaccination and screening programs are either poor or non-existent. In fact, out of 55 African countries, only nine have ways, have the preventive strategies in place, and Nigeria is not among this. And that's because it's expensive. And for that reason, it's beyond the risk of most women which are at at risk. Unfortunately, infections from HPVs are not symptomatic. So most women who have it don't know that they have it. And most screenings in developing countries are opportunistic. So people just pick it up by chance. And by then it's already late. So most presentations happen in women with cases that are too advanced to get help. But if we arm our women, they know what to do to prevent it. They know when to seek for help. Then we have a good chance of surviving. The WHO estimates that HPV, about 16% of our women have it as of 2017. So that's fairly common. Unfortunately, the coverage of cervical cancer screening is quite poor. So let's look at it in years. For women aged 25 and 34 in Nigeria, only 1.8% go for cervical cancer screening. Very, very poor. Overseas, about 90%. 6.6% of women aged 35 to 44 undergo these screenings. Just six, that's about five out of every 100 age this bracket. Now, 45 to 54 year old women, about 12.7%, about 10 out of every 100 go for these screenings. The number drops again to 2.8% for women aged 55 to 64. These numbers are very poor. Let's look at a country like Sweden. Up to 90% of women get screening, and it's all free. Now, keep in mind, in these numbers in Nigeria, people who can afford it, who pay for it. In this country, 90% is free for everyone. So what do we do? Do we just watch and pray like we always do? We all pray warriors in Nigeria, I know that. But do we keep doing that? Or do we take the bull by the horns and fight for ourselves? Well, the third preventive option that we talked about, which is lifestyle modification, is one way to do this. It's affordable in developing countries. It's free for everyone. And that really empowers our women through health campaigns. That's what the Amawa Youth Campaign is for. 
It includes so Ken Studio, which you're gonna learn through Dr. Zwicky soon, delaying the age of first sexual intercourse. As we mentioned, the younger one gets first sexual experience, the more likely the person is gonna contract HPV and the more likely the person is gonna develop um, cervical cancer by the time they get to 30 years or so. Avoiding multiple sexual partners. So sticking to one partner helps prevent um, cervical cancer. Avoid non-protected intercourse. So for those who must have sex, using condoms is important if you're going to prevent cervical cancers. Avoiding sex before marriage. So waiting till marriage um, is quite important. Avoiding smoking will also help. Avoiding many babies. So more than four babies, up to four, increases the risk. So basically, anything that increases the frequency and the number of sex worsens our chance of cervical intercourse. As we can see, I mean, some people have said, is it not too early to teach our youngsters? We you can see the factors we're teaching are actually the factors that are improved morals. So we're killing two bears with a stone. We're preventing cancers, and we're also improving morals in our societies. So the Amar Youth Campaign is, is, is a holistic way of improving our lifestyles and our morals. These measures are free and are of low cost. So let's do this, gentlemen and ladies. Let's work together and among our women. Unfortunately, despite these low and free costs, studies we did in 2017, again by the OCA Foundation, found that the level of knowledge on preventing these things are poor across Nigeria, and it's even among healthcare workers, which is sad. But with appropriate health campaigns, just like we have with the Amawa Eats, we can improve knowledge and preventive practices. We can tell our youth, we can arm them, we can arm them young, which is what we're hoping to do. We can arm them all, all of them, no one is an exception, but we can arm them now. That's the whole idea of what we're doing. We can improve perceptions. We can make our women more prone to take or undertake cervical cancer screenings, undertake the preventive vaccines, spend money on our health. That's the whole essence of this. Improve screening optics. So we can help them to increase screening uptakes. We can improve the adoption of positive behaviors among those affected. So improving behaviors like avoiding sex, sticking to one partner, avoiding premarital sex, and then seeking um, screenings. You know, even when the vaccine eventually becomes available, even when the government are able to do what we hope they will do at some point, these empowerments will help our women to undertake the available help. Because I've spoken to a lot of friends who tell me that they are not going to do screenings or vaccinations. They're worried about one or two things, but that's because of ignorance. So if we arm our women early, when help becomes available, they're more likely to take up this help. As we all know, the poor statistics in developing countries are largely due to poor awareness. So a summary of the rationale as to justifications. Most cervical cancers in Nigeria and women in their mid-30s. This is important. Women in their mid-30s, and this keeping in mind, it takes 10 to 20 years for the virus, the HPV, to progress to cervical cancers. So if we put this in context, women in their mid-30s, they have had to live with these viruses for 10 to 20 years. That means that the earliest exposures to significant HPVs will be among women from their mid-teens to their early 20s. These are women in senior secondary schools and in the undergraduates. These are women we are targeting. Now, if we decide to wait till they're in their 20s, we have a problem. Between 71 and 81% of women in Nigerian high institutions, universities are sexually active. This is from a study. Now, if we said women before the age of 20, it's more than half, about 51.7%, already sexually active before they turn 20. Let's keep in mind that these viruses happen solely from sexual intercourse. They are sexually transmitted. But if we're going to wait, then about half of our women are already sexually exposed before they turn 20. And about 80% are already sexually exposed by the time they get into higher institutions. But let's look at our 16-year-olds. Only 15% are sexually active. And these are the numbers we have in senior secondary schools. If we catch them early, we will only be losing about 15%. But remember, when we catch them early, the news goes down, and even the younger ones will be saved. So if we catch them early, that's 15.6%. Compare it to 51 or 81% if we wait till they finish senior secondary schools. So we have to start early. Now, the age of sexual activity commences in Nigeria between 167 to 179 years of age. So if we wait till they turn 16, we are losing quite a lot of them to sexual exposure and to HPVs. This is the same age when they are mostly in their final, in the final year of their senior secondary schools. 
So given this targeting women in their meetings while they're in senior secondary schools will be reasonable because delayed intervention still tertiary institutions will come late to many. These are huge daring facts. So we ignore it to our own peril. So we have to intervene in senior secondary schools. Let's look at other rationales, other reasons, other justifications. As already noted, vaccination and screenings are not available to most Nigerian women. Therefore, lifestyle empowerment at early ages is the key to save millions of women. No past intervention has ever looked exclusively on high school. Ours is the first, the first to intervene in high schools. Past interventions of included populations in among teenagers, yes. But usually these are focused in women in the in tertiary institutions, which we already know more than 80% of them are already sexually active, already potentially exposed to HPVs. So we have to teach them early or we lose them. Only a fraction of the women that we currently target on these interventions are under the age of 20 years. A majority of them will already be sexually active and exposed to HPVs. So a bit of a summary as to why intervention and senior secondary schools are important. Our studies reveal that there are no reliable sources of cancer information to young women, not from health workers, not from school teachers, not from religious institutions like churches and mosques. But if we engage these people, we have a good chance. Our focus is on school teachers and schools, but health workers and religious institutions should please pay attention. Schools and religious activities are very popular in Nigeria. About 76% of Nigerian women aged 15 to 24 are literate. And if we target this number, we have a good chance of reaching out to many Nigerian women because most of them go to school. That's why we've chosen to do this across every school, across every state, across every region in this country called Nigeria. And Amber City is only the first, but all others will follow suit. 90% of Nigerians are either Christians or Muslims. If religious institutions can come on board on this, we have a good chance of reaching out to everyone. At this stage, your CIA Foundation is focused on schools. We call on corporate institutions to help us reach out to churches and Muslims. Religious institutions will also reach the illiterate ones. So those that are not in schools, as we know, 76% are in schools, but the other 24% are not. And most of them still go to church. So if religious institutions, churches, mosques, mosques, and all that get on board with this, then we have a good chance of reaching out to everyone. Unfortunately, the internet and electronic media like television are expensive. And most times we don't have power. So using them are not very, very effective. So their role for now can be complementary to the Amar Youth campaign. But we have to keep in mind that ensuring engagement is vital to long-term success of the interventions. I'll come to that in a minute. So the recommendations. Anti-cervical and anti-breast cancers should target teenagers in senior secondary schools in Nigeria before the age of 20 years and before they become sexually active. Including distance into the school academic curriculum is recommended, and that's what we are doing at the Amor Youth Campaign. And that's why we're grateful to the Anambra State Government for letting this happen. Measures that will increase engagement is recommended. So it's not just teaching these people and walking away. So you would know that the OCF Foundation has been doing this since 2017. But then engaging these people beyond those teachings is what the Amor Youth Campaign is meant to correct. And engagements are from inbuilt assessments, through examinations, through quizzes. So that's why we are urging you to please make sure that it's not just you teaching them, that this is assessed through examinations. And we want to build it into the civic education course so that it becomes compulsory for everyone and built into the exam. So not separate exams, but part of the exam papers and this course towards the civic education course. This way, we are sure they're going to be engaged. This way, we're sure they're going to remember this. And then repeating these teachings, because we know that repetition helps transform learned behaviors to habits. The more we repeat it, the more they'll retain it, the more they'll remember what's being taught and the more they're going to retain it across the years, even when they graduate from senior secondary schools. As already noted, involving religious institutions and healthcare workers will be important. So combine all the above, we make life-saving information accessible, accessible to everyone in ways that are affordable, in ways that are wide-reaching, that are realistic, and that are sustainable. And that's why I want to do this to all of them while they are young, to do it to all of them and to do it now. So we're not waiting until tomorrow, particularly in a country like Nigeria, where universal health preventive programs are not existent. 
This is the end of this presentation. We thank you very much for listening. I hope uh, I've tried to do my, uh, you know, I've done my best to make it a comprehensive yet concise presentation so that we know why we have to be champions of this program. Thank you very much for listening. Please, we must arm our youths. We must arm them while they are young. We must arm all of them. And we must arm them right now. Thank you very much for listening.